Palmyra was an ancient oasis city in the Syrian desert. Palmyra was important because of its location in the middle of the desert, so it worked as a connecting point between east and west. Archaeologists have recorded more than 3,000 funerary portraits from Palmyra, made from the 1st to the 3rd centuries AD. In fact, we have more examples of portraiture in the Roman Empire from Palmyra than any other city except Rome itself. The portrait busts from Palmyra are representations of individuals. That's what makes them extremely interesting because they actually give us the names and the family connections of these deceased people. In the case of a funerary portrait, you experience how an individual wanted to be remembered after death. So the Palmyrene portraits provide us with interesting insights into the identity of ancient Palmyrans. Well, originally, they were put up as closing slaps in front of burial niches in the monumental tower tombs, underground hypogea, and also the te so-called temple tombs. There are five levels of portraits, and these would have been closely adjusted technically, so in the way that they were actually done, to where in the grave that they ended up being positioned. These ancient faces on the one hand, have a very modern look to them. On the other hand, they are quite stylized and made in a very unique Palmarine style. You recognize these as Palmarine no matter where you encounter them. The funerary bust would originally have been brightly colored, and some of them would even have had gold leaf. The richer that Palmyra gets through trade, um, the more elaborate these busts also become. The beauty of Palmyra came from an elite grave, so one of these temple tombs. And it's a unique piece of evidence for how lavish these busts could actually be. The jewelry is extremely detailed. So the bust is wearing seven necklaces. They are all different. The same goes for the headgear. So there are a lot of different jewelry attached to the headgear and textiles. The eyes would originally have been inset in colorful glass paste, adding to the overall high quality of this piece. It shows a very sensitive modeling, which reflects the Greco-Roman influence that we find in Palmyran portraits. We do not know who she was or what her name was, because the inscriptions, which probably would have gone with this bust, are lost to us on this relief. The funerary busts are not only interesting to look at from the front, they're very interesting to look at from all sides. And you can actually see how it's slightly slanting forwards, which would indicate that it was not put on the lowest shelf in a grave, but actually a bit further up so that it could look down on its viewer. We are looking at um, Marquis, a uh, man from most likely the early 3rd century AD. Um, he has a very nice hairdo, so-called snail curls, and nicely almond-shaped hair, a Roman-style beard, and he's wearing a himation, so a Greek-style cloak, which is also the cloak used most commonly in these funerary busts. Like many portraits from ancient Palmyra, this bust has an inscription that helps us put a name to a face which is rare outside for portraits made elsewhere in the Roman Empire. We have over a thousand of these inscriptions left on the funerary busts, and they are almost exclusively written in Palmyrene Aramaic. We've only identified 32 in Greek and five in Latin. In fact, the early interest in these busts was not so much as works of art, but because of the inscriptions in Aramaic, which to early collectors had a biblical association. Only a portion of these funerary busts are still in Palmyra. The vast majority of the tombs of ancient Palmyra were robbed over the centuries. Very often their contents, including the busts, found their way into collections in Europe, the Middle East, and North America. Most of them made their ways into European collections from the middle of the 18th century. This was the time of European missions going around in the region, and they all, all wanted their little share of, of, of Palmarine cultural heritage to take home. And this was what you did at the time. There wasn't cultural heritage pr protection as we know it today. The early 
mapping of Palmyra from the 18th century does really reflect the site as it was at this point in time. Um, so it's extremely valuable for us today as documentation for where were these monuments in fact located. And they also map monuments that we cannot see anymore. The scholarly approach to excavations was very different from today, where looters and foragers are after purely financial gain. The 19th century was when the large European collections were built up. So the one at the New Carlsberg Glyptothek, which is the largest outside of Syria, um, and the one at the Louvre and the Istanbul National Museum. Today, there are about 170 portraits from ancient Palmyra in the United States collections. We are talking all over the country, including in places where you would not expect to find them. Not just major museums, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, but also in places such as Laramie, Wyoming, and Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Even in small college museums, Mount Holyoke, Amherst, Middlebury, you'll very often find one or two of these busts. The Syrian conflict has changed everything in Palmyra. Its monuments and art have been destroyed and research on the ground is impossible. But even despite the war, scholars have made many advances in understanding ancient Palmyra in the last five to 10 years. Art historians, archeologists, historians, epigraphers, scholars of religion, all are coming together and creating a large view of ancient Palmyra in its social and cultural context. Scholarship on, on Palmyra matters because scholars also can communicate to a broader audience about the importance of these sites, which are not alive today, but which should be brought alive because the past tells us a lot about the present.